let's rank some devious little henchmen. Hi everybody, Nikki Marr here and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope you all have had a fabulous week and are ready for another fun ranking video. And thank you so much for all the love on last week's video. Ranking Disney couples was definitely one of the most fun videos I've ever had because I could really dig into a lot of detail with that one. And it makes me so happy to know that you all enjoyed the content, especially because you picked it. And that was so fun that I wanted to do it again because on that very same poll that I posted in which the Disney couples won, in second place happened to be another topic that was definitely on my horizons, but I definitely wasn't expecting to do it this soon. But you guys wanted it, so in second place on that poll won Disney Villain Sidekicks, and so that is what we are going to be ranking today. If you are excited for today's video, make sure to like and subscribe down below so that way you never miss magic from me because I have been enjoying making content so much and believe me when I say there is much more to come. In addition, if you'd also like to find me on other social media platforms, my handle is at Nikki Mara with two I's and two R's. And you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat for even more magic. But today we are diving into the topic of Disney henchmen or Disney villain sidekicks. Now this video is definitely one that I have been looking forward to doing because in all honesty, I feel like this topic has some of the most variety out of any other Disney topic. Because there tend to be a lot of sidekicks that skew both towards the side of good and evil. So I have chosen my top 25 Disney villain sidekicks and we are going to rank them from worst to best. Before we get into today's ranking, I do have some brief disclaimers and conditions for the list today, but if you would like to jump right into the ranking, then you can head right to this timestamp. First and foremost for the disclaimers, I am not associated with the Walt Disney Company, I do not speak for the brand or the company, and all opinions in this video are just my own and do not reflect those of the company. And secondly, I welcome any and all opinions on these amazing Disney characters and movies down in my comments, so I highly encourage you to leave all of your thoughts down below. If I happen to rank a sidekick super low that you really love, make sure to tell me why you love them down in the comments. It has been so fun getting to connect with you guys down in the comments, so I definitely look forward to hearing all of your thoughts. And for our conditions today, these characters are my top 25 Disney villain sidekicks. Now just to break that down a little bit further, these are characters that aid the Disney villains in their movies. They once again must come from a Disney animated movie, so no outside companies. And the only characters we're really not going to be talking about are the ones that come in massive groups. So think of Maleficent's goons, there are just way too many of them to pinpoint individually. And I also don't feel as though it's necessarily helpful to rank them as a group on today's list. The only exception to this is if Disney villain sidekicks come in pairs or in trios. If a specific Disney villain happens to have two henchmen that are very similar, then I will be ranking both of them together. Same thing if they happen to have three henchmen that are just very similar. And the reason that I did this for today's video is that they usually all tend to have the same goal, which is to help their Disney villain on their endeavor. And I also wanted to have an even number of 25. <laughs> but besides that, as long as they are a Disney villain sidekick in a Disney animated movie, they have the possibility of being on today's list. And with all of those disclaimers and conditions out of the way, I believe we are ready to start ranking some Disney villain sidekicks. And really quick before we get into the list, I do want to talk about the three talking points that we're going to be discussing for each villain sidekick. These three talking points include the purpose that this villain sidekick serves in their movie, number two, their relationship to the villain, and thirdly, we're going to be ranking where these Disney villain sidekicks fall on a morality scale. This means do they tend to skew on the side of pure evil like their villains, or do they tend to be unhelpful to their villains and side on the side of good? But rest assured, we're going to break it all down and more on today's list. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a snack and a drink, and let's get ready to rank some iconic Disney villain sidekicks. We are starting all the way down at the bottom of my list today at number 25, who is the King of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland. Now, this villain sidekick is just to die for. He is so cute. The King of Hearts is, of course, the sidekick of the very villainous Queen of Hearts. And how I would describe him in his movie is just a very small character that is honestly used for laughs. The Queen of Hearts tends to be larger than life and have this really huge temper. And the King of Hearts is this tiny little man who is so cute and always tries to calm down his wife. As for the purpose he serves in his movie, it's not necessarily a big one. Much like the villain in this movie, the Queen of Hearts, he doesn't appear until the very end of the movie. 
essentially appearing in only the last 20 minutes of the film. But regardless, when the Queen of Hearts arrives, the King of Hearts is right by her side, and he is often forgotten and left by the wayside, with the Queen of Hearts getting the big announcements, and the King having to run up to the White Rabbit and remind him, oh yeah, I'm here too. <laughs> He's just a fun little moment of comedic relief, especially when dealing with the Queen of Hearts, who can be intimidating and scary. As for the relationship to the villain, he is married to the villain, and I think it is safe to say he is the sweeter, kinder, and a little bit more gentler side of this coupling. <laughs> and as for the moral scale, in all honesty, he sits very middle of the road for me. When it comes time for Alice to be put on trial, he ends up not necessarily siding with her, but definitely following the rules of the court. Just as an example, the Queen of Hearts tends to jump to conclusions and set a sentence before an actual decision is made of whether or not Alice is guilty or not and the king constantly reminds her, oh, we need to do things the right way. For me, he sits right in the middle and is not necessarily a nuisance to the villain, but also is not a nuisance to the hero. But yeah, he's so cute. I love the King of Hearts and he makes me laugh every time he comes on screen. And with that, we're moving on up to number 24 on my list, the iconic duo of Brutus and Nero from The Rescuers. Now, Brutus and Nero are the two crocodile pets of Madame Medusa. They constantly do her bidding. They sometimes serve as a mode of transportation for her. And overall, they kind of just exist as an intimidation tactic. While Madame Medusa is quite scary, she is at ground level, a human, and therefore she needs something in this movie in order to make her seem more scary. And in my opinion, it's Brutus and Nero that absolutely serve this purpose. For the relationship they have to their villain, they are the pets of the villain. They tend to go along and follow the bidding of Madame Medusa, of course, until the very end. But in all honesty, they are non-speaking and they really don't do a ton in their movie, which is why they tend to rank really low on my list. But in all honesty, I think they add a lot to the movie because they make Madame Medusa a lot more scary. Now, as for where they sit on the moral scale, in all honesty, I think they're pretty middle of the road. And I say this because they definitely do scare and intimidate our heroes in this movie. However, if you remember the ending of this film, it's not necessarily set in stone as to what happens between Brutus and Nero and Madame Medusa. It is the very real possibility that Brutus and Nero caused the demise of Madame Medusa. And so we can't necessarily say that they're 100% on the side of the villain. So yeah, I think Brutus and Nero are an iconic duo. They definitely serve a really cool purpose in their movie as an intimidation tactic, and they rank at number 24 on my list today. With that, we are moving on up to number 23, who is Lucifer from Cinderella. Now, Lucifer also did appear in my Ranking Disney Pets video, which I will link up above in case you're interested in watching, but I had to include Lucifer today because he does serve a very important purpose in his movie. For his purpose, he is the pet of Lady Tremaine, who is the main villain, and he constantly serves as a big nuisance for all of Cinderella's mice friends. There are so many scenes of cat and mouse chases throughout this movie, and it is honestly so fun to watch him lose every time. <laughs> Lucifer is quite comedic. He finds himself in many predicaments throughout the movie, especially with the mice being so funny and outwitting him quite often. Again, for his relationship to the villain, he is the pet of Lady Tremaine and therefore does a lot of her bidding. There are certainly moments where she can get on his nerves, especially when she needs him to get bathed by Cinderella, but overall his actions do sway towards the advantage of Lady Tremaine and therefore it is quite obvious that he is a very helpful sidekick. Even stopping Cinderella's mice friends from delivering her the key at the very end of the movie. And he is only vanquished when faced with Cinderella's dog friend Bruno. And as for the moral scale, this is a pretty naughty cat. <laughs> He is an absolute menace to all of our heroes and is definitely a nuisance to anybody that comes across him. And so on the moral scale, I definitely rank him on the side of evil. But with that, we're gonna creep on up to number 22 on my list, who is Creeper from The Black Cauldron. Now, once again, The Black Cauldron is pretty much a movie that appears on every single one of my rankings, even though it's not necessarily a popular Disney movie because I love it and I absolutely love talking about it. Creeper is the henchman of the Horned King in this movie. And I did talk quite a bit about the Horned King in my Ranking Disney Villains video, which I'll link up above. And I talked about how scary this villain is. He truly is one of the scariest Disney villains in terms of his visual and his voice acting anyways. But in this movie, Creeper, as a villain, sidekick 
really helps to balance out the evilness of the Horned King. And this is because he is the rather annoying and silly character. When the Horned King is throwing threats of violence at him, he really is the character to cower and sort of suck up to the Horned King. When the Horned King has a victory, the Horned King himself doesn't necessarily celebrate, but Creeper will always be jumping up and down and celebrating. I guess what I'm trying to say is he's a lot more animated and cartoony than the Horned King, who is very scarily realistic. For the purpose he served in his movie, Creeper is essentially the right-hand man to the Horned King. He delivers all news that the Horned King must know to him, and he also serves as an emotional and physical punching bag for the Horned King. And as for the relationship he has with his villain, it is definitely one built out of fear. Creeper very much seems like the character who is staying by the side of the Horned King so that way he can stay alive. Again, just hearkening back to how scary the Horned King is as a character. And as for the moral scale, he pretty much does the bidding of the Horned King the entire way through the movie. However, he also does seem somewhat relieved once the Horned King is vanquished. And so I don't necessarily think he's the most evil character, but I do think he does a lot of what he does out of fear. And so I will say he's evil, but not the most evil. So with that, we'll move on up to number 21 on my list, who is Wiggins from Pocahontas. Now this is one character that I can actually get around in this movie, <laughs> because Wiggins very much seems to have a moral compass, one of the only colonists in the movie to actually have one. Wiggins is the hired help of Governor Ratcliffe. We can assume that they were matched together either by their own choice or by some sort of matchmaker, because they actually both make the comment of how highly rated each other was. As for the purpose Wiggins serves in his movie, he is technically the right-hand man to Governor Ratcliffe, however he never really does the bidding of him. He more so serves as a personal assistant, I would say, rather than a henchman. Wiggins' duties tend to be more so looking after Percy and making sure Governor Ratcliffe has all of his cosmetic items, like his suit and his armor, but Wiggins never actually does any act that is technically good or evil. He's definitely a side character and not one that influences the plot. Again, for the relationship to the villain, he he is more so the personal assistant, so he's not so much doing the evil bidding of Ratcliffe. But the most interesting part of Wiggins is his moral scale. I would definitely classify this villain sidekick as morally good. When Governor Ratcliffe is looking at the situation he's in and he's wondering to himself what could have made the indigenous characters attack him, Wiggins gives him a good long list of actual viable reasons as to why they would. He is definitely the voice of reason in this movie, and I am quite confident in saying if he was given a higher position in terms terms of decision making, a lot of the battles in this movie might not have happened. And while he's definitely not the most interesting in terms of fulfilling a villain sidekick role, I really do like this character. And with that, we're moving on up to number 20 on my list. This one is definitely a personal favorite, and I had to include this character because of how cute I think he is. At number 20 is Sour Bill from Wreck-It Ralph. Oh my god, I love this character so much. Sour Bill is once again a personal assistant-esque character. He serves King Candy in the land of Sugar Rush. He very often just does menial tasks for the king, and often doesn't make a lot of big decisions in terms of hurting our heroes. He definitely would if asked by King Candy, as opposed to Wiggins, but that big decision making never really happens in the movie. In terms of his relationship to the villain, King Candy is the king of Sugar Rush, and Sour Bill sort of serves as this right-hand man sort of servant. Again, he more so gives off the energy of a personal assistant, much like Wiggins does, because we see a lot of the tasks that he does which are rather menial, as opposed to actually being a task with an evil endeavor. And as for the moral scale, I will definitely say that he is a lot more aligned with the side of evil, but he really just doesn't seem like an evil character, because this little sour gumdrop has so much attitude. It doesn't matter if he's talking to King Candy, to Racket Ralph, to Vanellope, he has a sour attitude, and in all honesty, I think it is so fun and magnetic to watch. This is one character who is not afraid to throw attitude at anybody, and in my opinion, I think it just makes him stand out. And I think his character design is so cute, too. So yeah, in terms of the moral scale, I would say he's just... attitudinal. <laughs> But with that, we're gonna move on up to number 19 on my list. Let's get into some villainous characters. At number 19 is the Stabbington Brothers from Tangled. At the very beginning of their movie, we actually see them on the side of Flynn Rider. They have taken up the same career and are working together as thieves, even to the point where they're able to successfully steal the crown from the castle in Corona. However, because Flynn Rider also does stab them in the back, they turn on him, and they are much more of a threat than originally thought. 
About halfway through the movie, we see Mother Gothel trying to get Rapunzel back to the tower, and she enlists the help of the Stabbington brothers. And so the purpose they serve in their movie changes a little bit. At the beginning, they're working with Flynn Rider in order to accomplish the goal of thievery, but after Flynn Rider has proved himself dishonest, they join the side of Mother Gothel and have the goal of getting rid of Flynn Rider and bringing Rapunzel back to the tower. So that brings us to the relationship to the villain. They don't necessarily know Mother Gothel, and so there isn't really a strong bond of trust between the two of them because in all honesty, she just appeared to them and handed them a deal right on the spot, and it seemed pretty good to them. And so they blindly agree and are also backstabbed by Mother Gothel. While these two brothers seem very mean and scary, they are wronged so many times in this movie. <laughs> and as for the moral scale of these fine upstanding gentlemen, it is rather safe to say that their morality lies where their money is. They don't really care what vile acts they have to do as long as they can make a profit. Which in all honesty can even make them a little bit more scary than some Disney villains. But regardless, their allegiance is very quick to change, so in terms of the moral scale, I would definitely call them evil. But with that, we're gonna move on up to number 18 on my list, who is Iago from Aladdin. Now, Iago was also on my Disney pets list, but I had to include him here because he actually does help Jafar quite a bit. For the purpose he serves in his movie, he is Jafar's pet parrot. He is a speaking character and also has the ability to fly, so he does prove himself to be quite helpful. Now the thing about Iago that's quite interesting is he's also a great impressionist. We see him literally do a perfect Princess Jasmine voice out on the terrace, one that's good enough to fool Prince Aladdin. And so throughout his film, Iago flies around and wreaks havoc on all of our heroes. He is very loyal to Jafar, however he does care quite a bit about his own safety. At the very end, when Jafar has been turned into a genie and has been vanquished and is getting sucked into his own lamp, Iago tries to fly away and leave Jafar behind. Jafar, of course, grabs onto his tail and brings him in with him, but this shows us that Iago definitely wouldn't do everything for Jafar, especially not be stuck in a lamp for 10,000 years. And so when it comes to his moral scale, I definitely think he is on the side of evil, but once again, I don't think he's the most evil. I would definitely label him much more of a menace than anything. And with that, we're moving on up to number 17 on my list, one we had to include because of pure icon, who is the character Pete from many original Mickey shorts. Now Pete is in the world of Mickey and friends, and therefore he has a lot of nefarious acts amongst Mickey and his friends. Now you might be thinking, Pete is a Disney sidekick? Well, not necessarily, but I wouldn't necessarily label him a main villain. And that's why I want to rank him on this list. Because in all honesty, it feels like he serves the purpose of a lot of Mickey's friends, which is to be a Mickey sidekick. He just happens to be one that throws in some monkey wrenches to Mickey and his friends. And so once again, throughout all of the shorts and all of the media he appears in, he's not necessarily a villain, but more so a sidekick to Mickey that serves as a menace. In terms of the moral scale, he definitely is more on the side of evil, but again, not necessarily a pure evil. It's more so, how can I be a nuisance to the people around me? I don't know. You might include Pete in your Disney villains list, but I think he's more a sidekick to Mickey. But with that, we're gonna move on up to number 16 on my list, who is Sir Hiss from Robin Hood. Now I've said before that I am not a fan of snakes, but I actually do like this one quite a bit. Sir Hiss proves himself quite helpful in multiple scenes often seemingly have a lot more intelligence than the main villain, Prince John, in this movie. Being a snake, he is able to fit himself into very small locations, which allows him to eavesdrop on a lot of different conversations, and overall just proves himself to be very helpful. As for the relationship to the villain, he is the servant of Prince John. He definitely seems a lot more likely to do nefarious acts on his own as opposed to being told to do them by Prince John. It seems more like he knows Prince John and all of his thoughts and the direction direction that Prince John wants to go, and so he is able to act on his own in order to help Prince John's vision. And in terms of the moral scale, it feels like he's a little bit more villainous, because he is acting on his own accord in certain scenes. However, we can't say he's necessarily pure evil, because he does get punished quite a few times for actually acting on his own. Even though his intentions are in the right direction, Prince John doesn't always necessarily agree with the way that Sir Hiss does things. So with that, we'll move on up to number 15 on my list, who is Gideon from Pinocchio. Tokyo. Now Gideon is so cute and so funny. What is really cool about this character is that he does not speak a single line in his movie. However, he is easily one of the funniest characters in this movie. For the purpose he serves in his film, it is definitely comedic relief. 
he is the right-hand man of Honest John, and he finds himself just going along with life and doing his own thing. However, what makes him super funny is that he does a lot of things that Honest John ends up suffering for. In all honesty, it's a little unclear what his relationship is to Honest John. They might just be friends, they might be co-workers, they might just be a couple of swindlers. But regardless, it is safe to say that Honest John is definitely the brains, however small those brains may be. <laughs> and in terms of the moral scale, Gideon definitely shows some signs of being evil, but in all honesty, because he is so silly and so bumbling, he really doesn't seem like much of a threat to our heroes. And so with that, we'll move on up to number 14 on my list, who is Lawrence from The Princess and the Frog. Lawrence actually starts out as the servant of Prince Naveen, carrying all of his bags and other items on the trip from Maldonia all the way to New Orleans. However, it is meeting Dr. Facilier that very quickly allows him to realize that he can be greater than what he is right now. And with all of these empty promises given to him by Dr. Facilier, he turns to the side of evil, and very quickly becomes the villain sidekick to Dr. Facilier. In his evil acts, he serves as the puppet of Dr. Facilier, becoming a decoy Prince Naveen, which allows Dr. Dr. Facilier to attempt to take over the city of New Orleans, and it even gets to a point where I really think he does realize, like, oh, maybe I may have made a mistake in putting my faith in somebody like Dr. Facilier. But in terms of the moral scale, I would definitely say he is out for himself and he is willing to do villainous acts in order to better his own situation. So with that, we'll move on up to number 13 on my list, who is the Sheriff of Nottingham, also from Robin Hood. Now, the Sheriff of Nottingham is a nasty, nasty guy. He is the definition of of steal from the poor to give to the rich, as he is in the command of Prince John. His job consists of going around and collecting taxes from all of the townspeople. And eventually, when Prince John raises the taxes so high that people can't afford them, the sheriff's job becomes to lock people up in jail. As for the relationship to the villain, it's sort of understood that Prince John is the acting ruler of Nottingham now, and so the sheriff is expected to just do his bidding. And as for the moral scale, this villain is definitely evil. He sees exactly what is happening all over town as he is literally walking through the town every single day. He ignores the problems of those who are less fortunate and is very willing to just go along with whatever Prince John is saying. And therefore he is the first villain sidekick on today's list to be labeled as pure evil. So with that, we'll move on up to number 12 on my list, who is Monsieur Dark from Beauty and the Beast. Now, this villain sidekick is really creepy. Interestingly enough, he only appears in a couple of short scenes, but his presence in this movie is undeniably memorable, to the point where the voice actor Tony Jay, who did Monsieur Dark, eventually also landed the role of Claude Frollo, who is the main villain in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Ooh, his voice just sends shivers right up your spine. <laughs> As for the purpose he serves in his movie, he is a very minor villain sidekick, appearing in really only two scenes. But as quickly as he is introduced, we learn that his intentions are not honorable. <laughs> He is the leader of the county asylum, the place where people go who have been labeled mentally disturbed. And when Maurice, Belle's father, is labeled this by a lot of the community, Gaston hires Monsieur Dark as a means to an end, as Gaston's goal is to end up getting Maurice into the asylum so that way he can convince Belle to marry him. And Monsieur Dark, with a pile of gold in front of him, is persuaded to help Gaston. And so he really doesn't have a big purpose in his movie, he doesn't have a strong connection to the villain, but yet, he is one of the lasting impressions of this movie. And on the moral scale, much like our Stabbington brothers, his intentions are easily swayed by the coins, which again, feeds into how scary he is. I love Monsieur Dark and I love his scenes and he creeps me out every time I see him. <laughs> but with that, we're gonna move on up to number 11 on my list, who is my only trio on this list. Yes, at number 11 is Shenzi, Banzai, and Ed from The Lion King. Now this cackling group of hyenas are some creepy animals creepy enough to serve the character of Scar. The purpose they serve in their movie is really just three henchmen roles. Shenzi and Banzai are obviously made out to be the more competent of the three, and Ed is really meant to be written off as a silly sidekick, quite literally being drawn cross-eyed. <laughs> But yeah, they really go around the elephant graveyard and throughout the Pride Lands, and they do the bidding of Scar. Of course, they always have their own personal interests in mind, but they also aren't afraid to do a lot of heinous things, as Scar tends to throw a lot of empty promises at them that they truly believe, such as, stick with me and you'll never go hungry again. That's a pretty big promise when being out in the middle of the savanna. And so Shenzi, Banzai, and Ed stick with him until the very end. When confronted by Simba, Scar throws them under the bus, and the hyenas 
his turn on him. And so while they do start off as very loyal henchmen to Scar, it is very clear that they are only out for their own personal good. And so in terms of the moral scale, I would definitely categorize them as evil. They are going after what they want and they'll do whatever they can to get it. And if someone stands in their way, they're willing to do what it takes to remove them. Ooh, that was creepy, sorry. <laughs> and with that, we have reached my top 10 favorite villain sidekicks. If you guys have any guesses as to who's gonna make the top 10, make sure to leave it down below. I feel like you guys know me well enough by now to at least guess one. But yes, moving on up to number 10 on my list, we have the Huntsman from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Now, while he is a very minor sidekick character, he does make quite an impression on this movie. The purpose that he serves in his movie is of course to be the henchman of the evil queen. However, I think he serves a greater purpose, as when he is tasked with killing Snow White in the forest, he is unable to do it. Literally the one task given to him by the villain, he is unable to complete. And the reason for this is because of Snow White's purity and her innocence. Him not being able to complete this task right off the bat shows us the impression that Snow White is able to have on other people. They instantly have sympathy for her and pity her, and this carries through the rest of the movie. But seeing it right off the bat from a person who seems like a very villainous villain makes it all the more impactful. As for the relationship to the villain, the Huntsman of course serves the evil queen, and he is truly in her direct line of orders, like he is meant to carry out every order she gives him, even to the point of showing her proof. But why I love the Huntsman and why he ranks in my top 10 is where he lands on the moral scale. While he does initially go out with the intention of following the Queen's orders, he is unable to do this because of his moral compass. And so he spares Snow White's life and to help her even further, he decides to cover up the fact that he was unable to complete his task by placing the heart of a pig inside the box instead of Snow White's. It is clear that no matter how evil he may come across, he actually might have a bigger heart than we all may think. And that's why The Huntsman makes my top 10. And with that, we're moving on up to number nine on my list, a very silly duo, who is Anastasia and Drizella Tremaine from Cinderella. Now this duo could really do with some singing lessons. <laughs> As for the purpose they serve in their movie, they are definitely nuisances to Cinderella. They constantly give her a long list of chores along with their stepmother that is virtually impossible for her to complete. And yeah, they really serve as a really big nuisance, constantly making fun of Cinderella and degrading her, and even ripping up her dress when it comes to Cinderella's time to go to the ball. As for their relationship to the villain, they are the daughters of the villain, and therefore their bond is probably thicker than a lot of other villain sidekicks on this list. By betraying the villain in this movie, they would essentially be betraying their own mother and therefore their own family. And so when it comes to talking about their moral scale, I definitely think they're on the side of evil, but that's definitely because they're young and impressionable, and that's the way their mother is bringing them up to be. So when it comes down to it, do I think Anastasia and Drizella are the worst or the most evil? Not necessarily. I really just think it has to do with their upbringing. There is no denying that Lady Tremaine is a very evil woman, and Anastasia and Drizella just happen to be in her inner circle and able to work for her. But with that, we're going to move on up to number eight on my list, another one of my favorites, who is LeFou from Beauty and the Beast. Now, LeFou, unlike Monsieur Dark, has quite a bit bigger of a role in his movie. He is Gaston's sidekick throughout the entire movie. He seems to be not only a sidekick, but also Gaston's friend, as they hang out together quite a bit, even when Gaston is hunting or if they're going to the bar together, they're almost always together. For the purpose he serves in his movie, LeFou is definitely a fun-loving sidekick, considering he starts off the song Gaston in the movie. And he honestly seems like a very nice person. He always tries to make Gaston feel better about himself, but the only downside is that he's on the side of the villain. Another good thing about him though that makes him seem a little less evil is that he never really seems like much of a threat. Even when he is storming the castle with his friends, he's very easily defeated, getting scared by not only the cook, but also having hot water poured on him by Mrs. Potts and her children. So he is very easily vanquishable. But as for the moral scale, he happens to be on the side of Gaston, which does make him evil. However, his actions themselves aren't necessarily the worst that we've seen on this list. And so when it comes to his moral scale, I feel as though LeFou really just acts upon the side in which he's in. If he was originally created to be a sidekick for Belle, I feel like he would have been 100% good, but since he is the sidekick of Gaston, he does side on the side of evil. But regardless, I really like him as a sidekick, and I think he is super fun to watch on screen. So with that, we're going to move on up to number seven on my list, who is Jasper and Horace from 101 Dalmatians. Now, I love this duo. They are so scary and intimidating, but also 
bumbling and silly, which makes them have a really great evenness between the two of them. Jasper and Horace serve as the hired henchmen of Cruella de Vil. She has hired them in order to steal the puppies so that way she can make her Dalmatian fur coats. And so they show up at the Ratcliffe's house right at the beginning of the movie, are able to steal the puppies, and bring them back to Hell Hall. However, when it comes time for them to do the bidding of getting the furs, the Dalmatians outsmart them and are able to escape them. And so at the very end, when they are chasing the Dalmatians down, Cruella and the two henchmen collide, and therefore all of the puppies are safe. And that's 101 Dalmatians in 30 seconds. <laughs> but yeah, for the relationship to the villain, it is very clear that they are hired to do a job, like they are strictly out here for the money, and they really don't care at the end of the day what happens to either Cruella or the puppies. And so for the moral scale, it really just seems like they're doing a job, but I'm definitely gonna put them on the side of evil because, you know, the job that they're doing is really unkind. <laughs> but I really like this duo. I think they have good banter between one another and also between Cruella. They have great moments of comedy, they have great moments of actually being scary, as we see the Dalmatian puppies even rear back in fear when they approach them. So yeah, overall Jasper and Horace definitely make my top 10. I really really like these sidekicks. And in all honesty, I wish we could kind of see them walking around with Cruella de Vil in the park. I feel like that would actually be really fun. And with that, we're gonna move on up to number six on my list, another duo who is Pain and Panic from Hercules. Now these two share quite a few similarities with Jasper and Horace. They are both a duo that even each other out pretty well. They have moments where they can be scary, much like where Pain and Panic turn into snakes, which almost attack Hercules. But they also have moments of comedy, such as with the Hercules merchandise that they end up wearing. And yeah, the purpose they serve in their movie is to do Hades bidding, but in all honesty, they're not really good at it. <laughs> Their one job that they have in the movie is to transform Hercules into a mortal, and they are unable to do it. But what's funny about them is they also do have the ability to act on their own, as they lie to Hades and say that it was 100% complete, which of course lands them in a whole bunch of other trouble. As for the relationship to their villain, they are very easily the little minion henchmen of Hades. And my opinion is that getting out of servitude to the Lord of the Dead is probably not the easiest task. <laughs> and so for their moral scale, I feel as though it is easier to go easy on them because they are in eternal servitude to Hades, but also aren't the smartest Disney characters. So I think they're definitely on the side of evil, but I think they're very susceptible to messing up the evil plans, which definitely makes them not as much of a threat. God, I just love Pain and Panic. They're so fun to watch on screen. But with that, we're gonna move on up to my top five. At number five is Mr. Smee from Peter Pan. I love Mr. Smee. He is such a sweetheart and so funny. He is the first mate of Captain Hook for the relationship to the villain, which means he pretty much does the bidding of Captain Hook throughout the entire film. He often seems like the servant of not only Captain Hook, but also every member aboard the Jolly Roger, because he really doesn't seem like much of a stereotypical pirate so much as like a personal assistant. He definitely has his moments where he will like go and capture Tinkerbell for Captain Hook, but in all honesty he never does anything that would end up hurting any of our heroes. And although he is the right hand man to Captain Hook, he just seems very silly and in all honesty is very fun to watch, but that also means he's not necessarily the most helpful villain sidekick because Captain Hook can't really rely on him to do a lot of his evil bidding. And in terms of the moral scale, I would go as far to say that Mr. Smee is actually on the side of the good guys. Not 100%, but in comparison to a lot of other characters on this list, definitely. And this is really because he has a good and sweet heart. He's willing to help Captain Hook, but he's also willing to make sure that nobody else gets hurt in that process. And on a very similar note to Mr. Smee at number five, we're moving on up to number four, who is Kronk from The Emperor's New Groove. Now, I am the first person to admit that I am not a huge Emperor's New Groove fan. I don't rewatch it as often as a lot of the other Disney movies. But let me tell you, when I do, Kronk is easily my favorite part of this movie, alongside with Yzma, of course. Now what's funny about Kronk is that he literally shows in the movie the exact thing we've been talking about this entire time, which is the moral scale. On one shoulder he always has the angel and the other the devil, and they often banter back and forth and he gets caught up in the middle of it. 
he often doesn't know whether he should be on the side of Yzma or on the side of Pacha and Kuzco. He definitely more often than not sides with Yzma and will do all of her bidding, but it's never a guarantee. For his purpose, he is definitely the comedic relief in this movie. Along with Yzma, however, he shares a little bit less of that evilness that she has. As for his relationship to the villain, he definitely seems like a hired help and also has that personal assistant-esque role, as he often cooks for her and also serves as a mode of transportation when he carries her in a backpack. And as for his moral scale, I would tend to say it's all over the place. In all honesty, he realistically is a good character, just happens to be on the side of evil. But I think that's also a big part of his charm, is that he has such a big sweetheart, but often has to do the bidding of an old cranky lady with very long eyelashes. <laughs> oh, and we have reached the top three. At number three on my list, is Diablo from Sleeping Beauty. Now Diablo is such an interesting character because he doesn't really make a huge impact in his movie, yet he does so much to help Maleficent. In the movie, Maleficent spends 16 years trying to find Princess Aurora, and in this time she has enlisted the help of her goons. And unfortunately we learn that they spend those 16 years looking for a baby, to which she gets very angry, and therefore turns to her pet Diablo, who is able to find Princess Aurora in the matter of a few hours. Diablo is a lot smarter than a lot of other Disney characters in this movie, and yet we don't tend to give him a lot of credit for it because he is a non-speaking pet character. But Diablo is very helpful and he is very loyal to Maleficent, even seeming to be the one thing in this world that she actually cares about. As when he unfortunately is turned to stone at the end of the movie by Meriwether, this is really the only thing that garners a reaction from Maleficent. She seems sort of shocked and taken back that something like this could happen. And so for where he fits on the moral scale, I would definitely say on the side of evil, but mainly because he is the pet of Maleficent, and I truly believe that he is 100% devoted to the mistress of all evil. And with that, we'll move on up to number two on my list, who is the iconic duo of Flotsam and Jetsam. Now, I love Flotsam and Jetsam. They are truly some of the only successful Disney villains in their movie. They are given multiple things to complete by Ursula, and in all honesty, they are successful at completing every single one of them. Even to the point where the only thing that truly destroys them is Ursula herself. Well, technically Ariel pushing Ursula and redirecting a trident strike. But yeah, for the purpose they serve in their movie, they are tasked with spying on Ariel, and then later flipping the boat to prevent Ariel and Eric from kissing, and then also capturing Prince Eric so that way he can't grab his spear to help Ariel. They're successful at everything that is thrown their way, and it's kind of cool to watch them succeed. As for their relationship with the villain, they are of course the pets of Ursula, or her poor little poopsies, if you will. <laughs> But yeah, as for the moral scale, I definitely think these two slimy eels are just pure evil. They're so fun to watch be an absolute nuisance to Ariel. And believe me, as much as I wish and hope for Ariel to succeed every single time, it is interesting to actually have her something worthy of being scared of going up against. Not only with Ursula, but also with her very menacing sidekicks. And with that, we have reached number one on my list of favorite Disney sidekicks. Have you guessed who it is? Here's your last chance to leave it down in the comments. But at number one on my list of favorite Disney sidekicks is the Magic Mirror from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I get chills every single time the Magic Mirror shows up at the very beginning of this movie. He appears when summoned by the Evil Queen in a bunch of flames. And when she asks him a simple question, he gives her a simple answer that sets off the entire rest of the movie. And yet he has made himself iconic enough to appear in such nighttime spectaculars as Phantasmic and even the villain segments of a lot of parades. The purpose he serves in his movie is to be a soothsayer-esque character and to supply the queen with the knowledge that she needs to rule her kingdom. However, when she starts asking those personal questions like who's the fairest one of all, he gives her an answer. And what's interesting to think about is who knows if he's honestly telling the truth. He could be going at that from a subjective point of view. But either way, the queen takes it as truth and she takes it way too far. So I guess the question becomes, could the magic mirror really have a mind of its own and want certain things to happen in the kingdom? Is the magic mirror himself actually trying to control the queen? These are all little questions that I love to think about when watching this movie because it makes the magic mirror and the evil queen so much more interesting. Especially when thinking about the fact that this movie came out in the 30s, it's a whole lot more complex if you throw in a whole lot of other details like that. And as for his moral scale, 
Who knows? We don't know. We don't know if he is intentionally trying to get Snow White harmed. We don't know if he's trying to manipulate the queen. We don't know if he's just telling the honest truth. The coolest thing is we don't know why he answers the way he does. And in all honesty, that makes him one of the most creepy and the most interesting Disney villain sidekicks. And that's why he ranks at number one on my list today. Whew. And with that, we have reached the end of my Disney villain sidekicks list. Thank you so much for watching. I had so much fun talking about all of these wonderful Disney characters. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to like and subscribe down below so that way you never miss magic from me. And if you would like to find me on any of my other social medias, you can find me at Nikki Mara with two Y's and two R's. And you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat. Once again, my friends, I am so grateful that you are loving the channel and enjoying the content thus far. And believe me when I say there is plenty more to come. Make sure to leave all your thoughts down below too so that way I can read and respond to I love getting to connect with all of you about our favorite Disney films, so make sure to leave me a comment down below. Thank you again so much for watching. I had so much fun. Enjoy the rest of your week. Stay magical, and until next time, I'll see y'all real soon.